All right, welcome everybody and thanks for attending the f To Flip or Not To Flip or Something In Between workshop. And uh, as I mentioned, there's about 30 slides. They're all available online. You're even welcome to log on during my talk. My, my plan is to take about 15 or 20 minutes to go through the presentation and then have a 15 or 20 minute discussion. And then I was told, I, I, maybe I was misunderstood, but I thought our, we were going to be meeting in a room with computers and microphones and headsets. Uh, and they asked me to make sure everybody gets their hands on during this workshop. So we'll play it by ear. If you have a laptop and are willing to share it, maybe we can do something like that. But I'm, I'm kind of open to however you want to handle the, the time allotted. Yeah. No, oh, thank you. It's Fred. <laughs> Fred, like Fred Astaire. I used to say like Fred Flintstone. And then someone told me, are you sure you want to be associated with that guy? Why don't you talk about someone more debonair, <laughs> like Fred Astaire? So this is my plan to divide the allotted time slot into my presentation, some discussion, although you feel free to interrupt and have discussions during the presentation. And then at the end, we'll try and do some hands-on. We'll see how that works. So I'm probably preaching to the choir, but the lecture classroom has a rep, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, can you grab a two-page handout there? It's two pages. Thanks. <clears throat> These memes kind of slap you up the side of the head, don't they? <laughs> Ouch! That hurts! <laughs> but learning research shows the students just don't remember what they're told. They, they have to discuss it or teach it to someone else in order for that learning to stay past the end of the class and even even during the class. When I began flipping, I, I started out and still do to this day something in between. I, I, I start out in the class, the first part of the class is mini lessons, think, pair, share, and group work and collaboration. And then the second part of the class, I do meet in a computer lab and the instruction is computer based and students work on their homework or take quizzes together or in groups while I go around and visit with them one-on-one. -on -one. And the first day I did this, I gave a fantastic lesson, I thought. I even got down on my knees in front of the class and begged them to remember this one particular concept I was trying to teach, all right? So 15 minutes later, I'm going around to the room, one -on yes, and the student got stuck on that one concept <laughs> that I begged them to make sure they understood. And, you know, maybe a small part of the class did, but obviously this student, it just, as so many things in a lecture do, just went in one ear and out the other. Eric Mazur, if you probably have heard of him, he's the, he's the guru in the physics department at Harvard who really popularized peer instruction. And his, his theory was that the professor lectures to John and Mary and the rest of the class. John understands it. Mary doesn't. The professor gives time for the students to collaborate. Mary explains it to John better than the teacher did. He found that was the case so often. And so he, that's when he began to incorporate peer instruction into all of his classes. The biggest complaint I often hear from professors at my school when I tell them what I do, when I have an interactive room or flip the class, they say, I, I can't do that. There's just too much content to cover. So the biggest change in your teaching has to be to convince yourself and your students that your job is not to deliver content. 
And so I often tell my students on the first day of class, here are some great sites you can go to for the content that will be covered this semester. My job will be to highlight, summarize, and motivate. And I find it's a whole completely different role for me. And I find that in the four hours per week of my classes that meet on site, I probably only spend an hour and a half or two of that in front of the room giving lessons or organizing collaborative sessions. Uh, and that's all I need. If anyone's stuck, they, there's plenty of places online they can visit for instructional material. In my discipline, for example, here's a few of them. I teach math. Uh, believe me, there's content. Every content is ubiquitous. You do not have to cover everything when you're teaching your classes. As I said, there's someone else probably has already covered it online as he, as well or maybe better than you. And it just, and, and as I mentioned, it often just goes in one ear and out the other. So if you can direct your students to resources online, they will become autonomous learners, not rely on you to teach them the content. It's just not, teaching is no longer about the lecture. I, it, it, but it, it's a very difficult concept to understand. We're so used to it. It's the way we were taught, right? Well, I was taught by the lecture method, and I turned out OK. <laughs> <laughs> is a, a retort you often hear. But it, it, teaching is just no longer about the content. And you will have resistance. I mean, I even had a, a student who said, Mr. Feldon, I paid tuition you know, to, to listen to you lecture. <laughs> Show me your stuff. <laughs> there, there are some students who, re, who will resist and resent this, any type of active learning. I don't work in groups. I want to work on my own. I've gotten an A in all my classes before. and So your job is to convince them otherwise. Your job is to convince them to, to get the best bang for their buck. They need to learn how to work collab collaboratively and share what they know with other students, that the best way to learn something is to explain it to someone else, uh, uh, that you only learn a small percentage of what you hear, but if you discuss it, you'll learn a lot more. And if you teach it to someone else, you'll learn even more. So don't you want the most bang for your buck? So you, you, you definitely have to sell them on it. Oh, I, I, as an example, OK, a couple of months ago, I was in uh, New Orleans at a conference. And I was staying. The conference was in a 50-story hotel. And there were six elevators. And none of them had any buttons inside the elevator. Has anyone been to a hotel yet? Yeah, it's new. It, they're, they're trying to, uh, or, you know, instead of forcing, say there's six elevators, the first three go to floors 1 through 20, and the other three go to floors 21 through 50. But, you know, what if a lot of people want to use the floors 1 through 20? Those three elevators are impacted. So it's better to have computers automatically distribute the passengers on the elevators, which is what this program does. And it just freaked every it freaked everyone out, including me. In my first elevator ride, I, I had no idea how to work these things. You've got to teach yourself. You've got to learn how to learn. <laughs> You know, there's, there was no lecture and homework on how to use the elevator at this hotel. So you're... <laughs> no, you pushed a button, and it told you which elevator to go to. If I wanted to go to floor 14, you push 14, and it says, go to elevator C. And I would go to elevator C. And if I didn't, I... I didn't get, get to go to my floor. I didn't, I didn't get to my destination. And if you change your mind, too bad. <laughs> So it took some getting used to. But we really, I mean, that's a corny example, but we really, we're doing students a favor if we teach them how to think critically, solve problems, and learn on their own. But you definitely have to sell them on it. I guess it all boils down to engaging your students. And I guess there's a big debate and discussion, you know, what constitutes engagement? Well, the body of research can tell you one thing. There's some excerpts from research that will help define what it means for students to be engaged. But anecdotally, in my mind, it means that basically students aren't falling asleep in class. They aren't 
checking Facebook or email in class, and they aren't asking questions like, what do I need to know this for? When am I ever going to use this stuff? So if they aren't doing those things, or this, <laughs> they're probably engaged. One of the things that I do notice, I have colleagues that are, have inverted their classes, and while students are doing their work, either alone or working together in groups, I see them behind the podium, n not asleep, of course, but I, I know they're checking email. I know it because I have received emails from my colleagues during their hours of teaching. So I know they're on email when they're teaching. And it's very difficult to do, to get out from behind that podium and sit down with your students. But I, I just envision someone tracking my movements, and I, and I make sure I get to spend a minute or two one-on-one -on -one with every student. And I have 30, 25, 30 students in the class. So I make sure I sit down individually. And sometimes I don't even talk about math. You know, I tell them about the great beer I discovered last night. Or students will tell me about the great party they went to. Or another time a student was not working. He had not brought his laptop. And he said, I have an iPad, but I can't do my math on the iPad. I said, oh, yes, you can. There are Flash browsers. I, I told him the name of mine, and it costs uh, four ninety five. And if you download that app, you'll be able to open up Flash-based, our Flash-based homework. And he just loved me. I mean, I just made his day knowing that he could do his homework on an iPad. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to share that info if I were stuck behind the podium. So you've got to get out from behind the podium. <clears throat> Some of the advantages of flipping we've already discussed in the session this morning. Do we have any Cal State? Professors, and, yeah, can you comment on that? Were you were you aware of that program, or were you a part of it? Pardon? I'm part of one of these uh, promising courses designed. Ah, uh, can you share with us what it's like? What's Have you been a part of it? Have you been a part of the program? I, I, we were just, um, we just began. I have a colleague, she's not, she's here today, but she's not part of this workshop. And she did it last year, so she, so that way we should have more things to share. Maybe she'll be. She's coming here in the afternoon. Oh, good. Workshop B, I'll have her share. Well, if you want to warn her, <laughs> heads up. Fred's going to ask you about the course redesign project, <clears throat> but it's it's definitely the word is spreading. the The word is spreading. the The bottom line, of course, is to move the content delivery outside of the classroom uh, by lectures that you either refer students to that already are out there. For example, I refer students to the publisher's website or colleagues or a few that I've done. I haven't done that many. I, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, I mean, I, you can, but hopefully they're high quality instruction and they serve a purpose. I mean, I have another professor at our school who was doing lecture videos for every section in the entire book cover to cover. And I said, well, why are you doing that? The publisher has lecture videos for each section in the textbook. They're pretty good. And he goes, ah, but they haven't seen mine. And I thought, hmm. So one day he shared his lecture videos at a department meeting. And he had pages of the textbook projected on the screen with it, while he read from it with his back to the camera. <laughs> Swear to God. <laughs> So, 
I don't know. See, there are good videos out there already. You don't, you don't have to create your own, although you do need something as part of your course that is personal. An introduction or what, what I do is, is take the most difficult concepts that I know students struggle with every semester for each course and I, I just make selected videos on those particular topics and it's a small number but it is something that personalizes and enhances the course. And then when you get to class, you have time for high-level discussions, the kinds of things I mentioned, where you can visit with each student one-on-one -on -one and form that connection that you, you just don't have time to in a traditional class. Your handout is uh, an article by Keith Hammond at Middle Georgia State University who phrases it this way, the, the internet has changed everything. You can transfer knowledge remotely and practice it locally. That kind of summarizes it in one sentence. And it is insinuating itself into the practices of everyone, pretty much everyone. So preparing this talk, I came across the research that Daryl and, and Rachel talked about <laughs> and he was very upset because he thought the article in USA Today did not make them look good and I said on the contrary I thought it was just kind of a, a caveat if you do use an inverted or flipped method of instruction you've got to do something you've got to do the right thing to, to fill up that extra space that frees class time up for discussion and collaboration uh, and problem solving. You can't just be checking your email. Otherwise, it won't do you any good. So, but the research does show that students believe in it. Here's a large scale survey that was taken of students that showed a very small minority, 23%, thought that the lecture was helpful to them and what was was important it was an important part of the class whereas the coaching and facilitating components of teaching were much more important to them so this is my goal i sometimes make it but it's more like 50 percent when i do it but that 50 percent is not all passive i lecture no more than 10 minutes and th then I assign a similar but different problem to the students using the think-pair-share technique. And I ask them to think quietly at their own seats without talking for a minute and then to pair up with someone who sits near them and, and compare answers. And if their answers are the same, it must be right. If their answers are different, to go through each other's work and find out what happened and I give some time. And during that time, the, pa the uh, pair part, I'm walking around the room. and. The lessons that I learn about how students think is, is amazing. Uh, I hear vocabulary that I would never use as a teacher. How many math instructors are there in the room? Okay, you ever heard the word derivatize? <laughs> <laughs> so I was listening to one student explain to another how he solved the problem. And he says, well, you derivatize it. And, and I just, I heard that and I go, man, dude, that is such a great word. Can I share that on Facebook? <laughs> So I did. I derivatized it, <laughs> which is a lot easier to say than differentiate it. <laughs> so it's just that's an example of how students can can learn from each other as well, or maybe even better than from you. Uh, here's another slide showing how difficult it is to get behind the podium. As they mentioned in this morning's session, students have have gamed the lecture system that works really well for them. They can be passive if they're a good or an excellent or a motivated or gifted student. It's really easy for them to kind of be semi-conscious during a class and spit the material back on an exam and do well. So you will you will get resistance. So here are some of the questions we'll have to talk about during our discussion time.
uh, this, the, the teachers who do not use any type of active learning, their answer is, I just, I, 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 there's too much content, there's no time. Um, if they try and teach themselves, they won't learn a better way to do it. And I admit, the computer-based learning program that I employ w has help buttons. When they're doing their work, they can click on a button that says, view an example or help me solve this. And uh, sometimes the steps that they show are convoluted. I would never do the problem that way. Not very often. They're usually pretty helpful. But they're just terrible. I would never recommend students solve the problem that way. Um, so uh, how do I, how do I, if, if they're learning on their own and they come across some help features of the program, how, how do I show them the right way? I know the right way and they don't. Uh, how do I make sure they're engaged? Uh, how can they possibly learn everything without me teaching it to them? It's a struggle. Well, here's an interesting research that I, that I read about. Uh, here's a diagram of a typical classroom. In the front, where you see the little, little triangle up there, is the teacher who never left the podium. The stars indicate all the questions the professor answered, I mean asked. And then the ovals represent all the answers. So it looks like a pretty active room. The, the teacher probably thinks they're doing a great job. But if you look at it carefully, this guy left at the break, this guy arrived late, arrived late, fell asleep, fell asleep, fell asleep. <laughs> if you look at it closely from the point of an observer, it's probably only engaging for a couple students and the professor, no more, no more than that. And those couple of students will probably learn no matter what method they're being taught, right? There is research that, that gifted and talented students will learn even with a, just as well from a traditional class or any kind of an active classroom or just reading the book on their own. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> so when I teach, I kind of pretend I'm I'm participating in this study, and I want to make sure I get out from behind the podium and spend a minute or two with every student in the room, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, yes. Yeah, it looks like here she is. Here's Vilma. Here's the observer. <laughs> yeah. never spent the whole time lecturing. That, that's how we learned. We did some activities. We would go up to the blackboard to present things. Instructor would go around. She would spend very little time that I remember in presenting what we, exactly what we're talking about right now. Uh, and so I look at my nine-year-old, who's in third grade, and it seems like they're doing a lot of hands-on activities in his third grade. Because first, uh, before then, I thought, that it's just the U.S. education is different than the instructor lectures and you just passively learn. But it seems that in third grade, they actively learn. So my question to you is, uh, I guess, twofold. One, uh, has it been, I mean, is it the same in, you know, school education as it is in college education? And if not, has there been a change that now in schools they do more active learning as opposed to college experience? I'm just curious how yeah. in the United States in general is it been? Well, I think, I think there is a difference. I think those of us in higher education never receive any kind of professional development. 
uh, and we're, you know, here, here's your assignment, you know, here's the curriculum, and go teach it. Whereas K-12 teachers, well, even, even K-12 teachers get very little professional development, right? Typically, they're handed a set of keys, and here's your class, good luck. In this whole country, there's very, but I think we've realized the, the faulty, the, 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 the fault in that. And so I guess teachers, faculty, and professional organizations, like in my discipline, there's the NCTM, the National Council of Teachers of Math for K-12. There's the AMATIC for the American Mathematical Association two-year colleges for the two-year schools. And then there's the MAA for the four-year universities. We're all realizing the, the problems with how we've been teaching. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I wish those of us in higher ed had to take some classroom technique, pedagogy. Uh, gosh, I, I observed a, a professor who gave a little lesson, and then there was a break, and then the break was over, and people were mingling and chatting and standing up, and, and he just walked up to the board and with his back to the class and started lecturing and writing w without... Yeah, without saying, welcome back, class. <laughs> Thank you. As soon as it's quiet and you're in your seats, I'll start. And then you wait for it. A simple technique such as that. He had no idea. He just, he just walked up to the room and started lecturing, even though they were all standing up and talking. And, and they, didn't, they didn't quiet down when he started talking. <laughs> so they had... I, I guess they were taking advantage of his lack of training in pedagogy, huh? Um, I, my big push is to try and get the furniture changed at, at our school. I wish that I had seats that were individually mobile so that you could quickly arrange it, you know, from rows to whole class discussion to collaborative groups but I'm getting a lot of resistance. The head of the maintenance said, Fred, I'll never get these kinds of chairs in the classroom because students just dump their trash in there. And I felt so sad because, number one, the professor should take care of that. Before the end of the class, the professor should say, students, could you please pick up the trash you know, in your, from your chair and throw it away? Uh, and or the janitor, you know, should just, I'm sorry, but if it really improves instruction, maybe my role as a custodian has to change from sweeping a giant floor to going around to individual seats and collecting trash. It's just, this, is, this would be so beneficial. So I'm fighting a battle. So my next step is to go to the Academic Senate, which I'm a member of, and ask them for support in getting, uh, because there's a body of research that shows that students prefer this type of seating. Yes? <coughs> this size. Yeah. So you're able to rearrange the furniture for about 20 or something? Yeah. Because that, that's a challenge. I'm when I started teaching here, I had the bottom layout. And that's because I had about 14 to 20 students per second. But then my last semester, I had 47 students. Wow, big so difference. Yeah. Yeah, you need to sacrifice. It just takes a minute or two. There was uh, one set of classroom where steel case, uh, at this video you'll see me and another math professor being interviewed using the new steel case furniture on wheels. It's not individual seats, but the, the chairs and tables are all on wheels. So it's easy to move things around. But it's amazing. I showed up one day and in my room was not scheduled in the room with this, this cool furniture. It was two doors down. So I went to the dean. I said, can I switch the furniture? She said, sure, Fred. A great dean. I wish she were still here. Fred, go for it. So I said, you guys, can we get this new furniture in my room? I had everybody get up and, and take their seats and chairs out into the hall. And all 30 of them slid it down. And then, then they went and picked up the new <laughs> furniture in the other room. It only took like five, three minutes, <laughs> four minutes. So you can accomplish a lot in just a couple of minutes. 
uh, moving the furniture around, whatever, whatever you have. It's a sacrifice that you can make in time that will more than reward itself in the quality of instruction. Yeah, plus it gets everybody up and moving and their blood flowing and wakes them up, right? <laughs> So I recommend it. You can you can just say I'm going to take a couple of minutes to have you all move the furniture, and then before you begin the class, you use that technique. Okay, is everyone ready to go? As soon as it's quiet, we'll start, and then they'll all quiet down. Anybody else have any comments on that? Yeah. That's great for a class sort of like this, or a room that already has things that are built in uh, with wheels. If we're back in the lecture hall over there in 1430, yeah, it's a disaster. yeah. It's a Yeah. Just two aisles. So getting the right room is a big deal. And not all campuses are designed to have a yeah. room or a room that's very close. Although I noticed this morning they were pretty effective with the group, right? We had some discussions in that lecture hall this morning. It worked. Yes. So Yeah. So at MIT, it's it's called the uh, Teal T. Yeah, I love it. I would. I'll take that info. I just slipped you my card. Uh, for the benefits of the listening audience, she just told me about MIT, the University of Iowa, who've done research in active learning spaces, and a, and a resource called EduCon that's also... Edu what? EduCause, E-D-U-C-A-U-S-E. EduCause, That also has a body of work on this. Thank you so much. I'll follow up on that because I just, I would just love to be able to walk into a room filled with these. I can just picture students kicking the floor and spinning all over. 
spinning all over, you know, and getting together in small groups like that and sitting where they want to. Uh, it might make it hard for professors like me to call in students by name. I'm terrible with names, and I usually have a seating chart. Even though I don't tell students where to go, they always end up sitting in the same seat every class, right? So I, I can learn their names that way. I'm screwed if they start using this. Uh, <laughs> but it'd be screwed in a good way, I think. Well, here are some of the answers, some of the answers to those questions that you don't give up as much control as you think. You still have to provide all the important components of a class with academic rigor, support, standards of behavior. Uh, you need to create a sa safe, non-threatening environment. I, I teach online a lot, and I'll give you an example where this was not done. There's a discussion forum. A student asked, a student told me about this. He had another professor in a, teaching an online class. A student asked a question and they answered it. And the student reply, the, the teacher replied, who do you think you are, the teacher? Harsh. Isn't that harsh? So you definitely, there's an example of a threatening, <laughs> unsafe environment. So you want to thank someone when they answer a question. In fact, if I'm teaching and there is a question, I'll often say, good question, anybody? That's right. Oftentimes a student will answer a question better than you can, and I'll often learn from my students. I mean, I think I know it all, but I'm surprised at the number of times every semester I learn a new way of thinking or solving a problem. It, it happens all the time. <clears throat> so you need to switch your role from the sage on stage to the guide on the side. I'm sure you've heard that slogan. Those are some of the things that good teachers do. They communicate question, challenge students, encourage, monitor that with the computer-based learning program that I use, it makes it really easy to any time I want, look in the grade book and see who's not doing well, who's not spending enough time on the course material, and I can reach out to them. You've heard the 80-20 rule, right? It applies to a lot of things in life. 20% uh, of your students should take up 80% of your time, the problem students. Those are the ones that I spend most of my time with, either in the classroom or online. I'll look at the computer gradebook and make a note of who's not doing well. And as I go around and visit with students, I'll make sure I spend a significant amount of time with them, those particular students, more than the others. With the computer-based learning programs we all have, there's you're not being replaced. There's no threat to you as a professor. But you need to do some of those other things that I mentioned in the earlier slides rather than deliver content, which any robot or computer could do as well or better than you. The results are its very fulfilling. How many people have watched Project Runway? This guy's awesome, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be Tim Gunn when I grow up. There's an example of what we should be as professors. I yeah. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. We share. We share the belief. This guy is friggin' awesome. If you want to see, I mean, th there are contestants, right? And there are judges. And you can think of the uh, judges as your exams, your midterm and final, where those are the summative assessments. But then Tim Gunn walks in towards the last 10 minutes of every session and just, like she said, how are you doing? Are you sure you want to do that? You know? <laughs> now, now, Jenny, I know your strength, and your strength is not is in color. Why don't I see color in what you're designing? You know, stuff, little comments like that. He's awesome. He's even written a couple of books. You know that, right? Oh, does anybody remember the title? Someone want to go online? Uh, yeah, there's something that's just such a positive title. Somebody go online and find out the name of Tim Gunn's book and share with us the title of his book. 
It's just freaking awesome. This is who I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> He's just awesome. He's so brilliant and encouraging. Say it again. The Natty Professor. Mm, yeah, all right. That's there's something else. That's one. Guns, golden rules. Life's little lessons for making it work. That might be it. Anybody else have a different title? Class on mentoring, motivating, and yeah. Making it work. Okay, say it again. That's the Natty Professor. It's oh. The Natty Professor, a master class on mentoring, mo motivating, and making it work. The Natty Professor. I'll speak into the microphone so they can hear. Uh oh, I've lost the screen. The Natty Professor, uh, how to mentor. Here it is. The Natty Professor, a master class on mentoring, motivating, and making it work. I recommend that. <laughs> Ooh, that's interesting. A cocktail. <laughs> I think the Natty Professor, I, a play, of course, on the Nutty Professor. But yeah, if just watch an episode of Project Runway and watch Tim Gunn at work and his relationship with the contestants, I think, is a role model of how of the relationship we should have with our students. And you, you will definitely learn more about your subject matter and the way they learn. Um, there's another professor in our, in our department who gives an online final midterm and final exams, and the computer just marks it right or wrong. There's no partial credit. And I asked uh, th them, do you, do, you make them, do you make them show their work? He said, oh, yes, they have to hand in their work. Do you look at it? He said, no. And I go, how do, you, how do you know what your students are thinking? How do you know what they learn and what they don't learn? And how can you adjust and modify your teaching you know, to incorporate that knowledge? And what if they just add 2 plus 3 and they get 6? But everything else, they've showed a great, clear understanding of the concept. Shouldn't they get some partial credit? Nope. He said, I never got partial credit. And I, well, I said, well, just because that's the way you were taught doesn't mean that's the way you have to teach. Anyhow, but uh, the more you can learn, we're so lucky in math, and I'm sure it applies to other disciplines, that when someone gets an answer, that shouldn't be the end all, be all. It should be why. How'd you get it? Share, could you share with the class how you got your answer? And I'll often have students come up to the podium and write down how they got their answer. And every step of the way, I'll have them pause. Do you all get it? Any questions? And if they make a mistake, I, I often won't say anything. I hope someone else will catch it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I'm just trying to share some insights. See, yeah. Uh, you mentioned about this online exam, right? That this other professor uses, <laughs> not me. <laughs> okay. Um, there are, like, just like we are talking about the classroom, there are different kinds of, I don't know what platform the universities use, like at Purdue we use Blackboard, uh, the Blackboard system. Right. So, for example, you mentioned Good. that you ask students to come over and write things down. There's a pitfall with every method. For example, I know from some of my students in my class that a student who knows the answer perfectly well is going to mess it up when he's asked to write it down in front of others when they are watching. He might otherwise, for example, one of the students who works with me on my research regularly, Always, when I ask him to work with me on a paper, the first question he will ask me is, I don't have to present it, right? That's the first mm -hmm. question he asks. And he, he says what? The student says what? I don't have to present it, right? I don't have to present it. I don't have to present it. Present it. All right. Okay. So there are students who have different levels of skills, but I keep, I mean, that's a different issue. I don't want to die because I keep motivating him slowly. You have to overcome that slowly, and we will get to that point when you're comfortable standing up in front of people and explaining your ideas clearly. So 
Even if we are like just like an online exam or quiz might have its own deficiencies. Even the kind of interactive things that we are trying or we are advocating or we are discussing about might have their own deficiencies because we are talking, we are not completely aware of the student capabilities at these interactions and collaborations when we are doing these exercises. Maybe those who are comfortable with those will do well, but those who are not, then we are dealing with a different set of issues here. So I'm not aiming for something. I'm just right. How do, how do you all handle that? Anybody have a response? What if you're asking for students to share their thinking, you know, justify their answers, and they don't want to? What do you do? Yeah. I don't know if I'm answering this question exactly, but dealing just in general with students that don't want to conform to the exact model we have in the day. I have this one student in particular I can think of who's very important. And there have been many times in class when I ask students to work with partner or in group and he'd rather just be by himself so I so after the first time when I said oh why don't you all make some friends and introduce yourself to a partner and let's do two three people groups and I could tell he was getting very uncomfortable and he would not initiate contact and I said or, you know, work by yourself if that's what your, you know, preference is. And I find, for the most part, unless somebody has a real uh, psychological issue with that, they are willing to try, even if they're just simply shy, they're willing to try to work with somebody or with a group of people. But in the case of this student, he was you know, not comfortable with that. So uh, after that first time, I would preface every time I would break them into groups by saying, um, let's try to work on these problems. Those of you that prefer to be working by themselves, that work by yourself, and those that prefer, uh, would, would like to work with a partner or in the group, why don't we do that? And that was fine. And everybody else would just partner with somebody and he was comfortable being by himself. But it was an uncomfortable moment in the beginning when I said, oh, let's break up into groups. And I realized he was getting very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so. Well, one response to that might be you, you pick the groups. Um, here's one technique. Uh, say you've got 30 students in the class. So I pick 10 from a deck of cards, ten ace, uh, three aces, three ones, three twos, and I shuffle them up and pass them out. All the aces meet over here, all the jacks meet over here, all the queens meet over there. That might help. So he has to go with the flow, he's got to do that. But... I said, why don't, like, John and his name make a group and he just... Yeah, the, the, the method I've shown this, this shows no bias, it's just random. It's not like I'm thinking that these students should work together or would work together. It's not my fault. Hey, dude, it's just the cards. I shuffled the cards and all the aces over here and the ones over here. Uh, you're right. I wouldn't make a big deal of it. Yeah. Yeah. The response, just for the microphone, was there's a website called Piazza that allows students to form groups and work online, which is less threatening and less uh, self or comfortable. That's, yeah, good idea. Thanks. And yes. Yeah, that was my question. It doesn't mean you have to be sensitive to in your classroom or psychological issues or social issues. Right. Yeah. I've never paid you a lot when I was in college because you know I'm always way up there, they're just dragging me down. So, you know, there's a good thing like that. They don't do you grow up because I'm doing eighty percent of the work and the rest of the doing terms of the work, you know. There is a rubric you can use that takes the percentage of the effort 
in, in a group project into account that the the project gets a grade and then everybody writes down what percentage of the they contributed and it should be if there's four people it should be 25 25 25 25 and then in that case everyone would get that grade but if someone only did 10 percent of the work or someone did 40 percent of the work then their their grade gets lowered or raised accordingly uh, i've heard of that yes What exactly, how do you, how are you allocating your, your classroom time? Like what, you know, I'm kind of like, I think yeah. it's a little bit more of like a, more of a pin down. Like what exactly are you doing in class? Like you say you lecture for 10 minutes. Are you starting off class with that? Or are you, what are you doing? With the sure. Is, is that like appropriate? Absolutely. Okay. Anybody want to share what they do in a typical class? Yeah. How does it structured? What do you do? Sure. And what discipline do you teach? Mathematics. Okay. So now I'm teaching math, uh, linear algebra, um, so matrices. So in the first uh, lecture, I asked, uh, because a lot of, you know, first lecture we usually spent on going over syllabus. And in the past, uh, I would spend so much time going over the syllabus. And between first lecture and second lecture, I would not assign any problems anyway because I felt I didn't cover enough material. So now this first time, I went, you know, this quarter, I thought, okay, so I didn't cover, I maybe did something very brief. I had 10 minutes to do. Then I had them read three pages where they were introduced to basic terminology. So matrix is, you know, a bunch of things put in the format where you have a rows and columns and you know, just get basic, you know, definitions, basic terminology, uh, you know, at least somewhere lingering in their mind so that next time when I meet them and when I talk about, oh, this matrix has this many rows, this many, it has, it's two by three, they know I'm talking about two rows, three columns or whatever. So I had them just simply do reading. So it's very basic flipping, you know, I didn't have them do watch videos, mine, or anything else. This reading is done in class or outside of well, class? Outside of class. In the second lecture for them to do the reading. And I said, we're going to do problems in class based on that reading. So then in class, I did just one problem based on the reading, row reducing. That's what they were reading about. And then I had them break into groups, and I gave them another problem to try to do row reducing. Well, and I saw, I, I think it worked. I mean, it was just one lecture, but in the past, I would spend a whole lecture, <laughs> an hour, talking about row reducing. Okay, you need to, you know, you can only s do three operations, switch two rows, you know, add a multiple of one row to another, and just writing this down on the blackboard would take so much time. And now I had them read about it at home, which I'm sure most of them didn't understand it completely. So they kind of read it, they kind of got a little bit of taste of it. Then when I did one example in class, they started putting things together. Oh, that's what the book meant to do this. And then I had some working groups and I went around and I helped them. And I think it worked. It worked much better than in the past. And it's just one lecture experience. Now, would I be able to do it in every lecture? I don't know. But I think already I'm thinking of, as a rule, assigning for them reading that introduces them to just even terminology or definitions. So then when they come to class, there's so many things to remember. At least they have that in their mind, and then we can do examples manipulating those definitions or statements of theorems remembering and things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it applies. <laughs> Anybody else <laughs> want to share what they do in a typical class? Yeah. Why do the flip down? Is that what you're looking for? Anything, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, <coughs> I usually just figure out ways they can, whatever they um, read about, how to read something and then watch a video quickly. And then whatever the, whatever the topics are, you try and figure out what the 
two or three main things are that you really want them to walk away with and make exercises at groups. I do, I pair them up because I want to make sure that, I don't want to be a group of three or four, because I don't know about you guys, but I, I can see a group of four people and two of them are just hanging out. Yeah. So I want yeah. groups of two so that they have to do stuff. And then they like um, build something or work a problem. Or one of the classes is a programming class where they have to write a little bit of code, to write some loops or something. And then the, they have to hand it in, and then it's just a pass fail grade on it. Um, the problem I have and why I came here is because I can't figure out how to get them to do enough during the class time that I feel like they've gotten the topic without having homework. And if you have homework, then you've got homework and prep for the next class, and that gets too much. So that's my question ultimately, is how do you figure out what to do in that class period that, that fits the timeline into there? Do you ask questions about the content, or should you just apply because I mix both? Mixing it up sounds good to me. I think we all do that. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, what I was hoping I could learn from this workshop or from this whole conference in general is how do you uh, hold students accountable? So yes, I understand that they, that's what I think they're going to that's what I hope they can now be responsible enough because they will not want to let their group down. But aside from that, um, my always my issue is making them or how do you ensure that they do the work outside the class? And with the homework in the past and now with reading or watching the video, how do you make sure that they do it? What if they don't do it? And then yeah. Kind of getting there are professors I know of who embed short questions in, in the lecture videos or make them answer a set of a small set of questions after they watch the video and they have to hand it in when they walk into class. There are also programs that you can have quizzes. Yeah. The video. You don't answer that quiz, the video will not go forward. Yeah. Yes. How do you spell it? Z a p t i o n. Did you have a comment or a question? It was TED Ed, T E D dash E D. Is that related to the TED videos, technology, entertainment, and design? Yeah. Yeah.
What's the reasoning? I mean, it sounds like most people, when they talk about flipping, they like have a bunch of lecture videos or whatever they watch online. But why is that? Is why is that better than saying like you need to read this uh, the book? Is it just that? Because I guess when you talk about like, students being bored in lectures, a lot of times because they're like, well, why do I need to pay attention? I can just read this later. So it, are lectures like do people do kids just prefer to watch the videos versus reading? I mean, what's the why why go through all that and making videos and da 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 when you have a book that already has all the information? Yeah, and I'm, so I'm with you. I'm lazy. I don't make as I mentioned very many videos. Yeah. I just tell them here's the ebook. Read read the textbook. Here's some videos. Here's another website you could visit. You know that slide with all those websites, and, and I refer them to that. Yes. Right. Right, like don't refer to chapter numbers and section numbers, instead refer to topics and concepts. So if you adopt another book or you get a new edition of the book, you can reuse it. Right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's like a, a free version of Camtasia. Yeah, I highly recommend it as well. Yeah. <clears throat> There's another one. It's not quite as fe rich, feature rich, but for a quick 10 minute, five or 10 minute video, Jing, and, and maybe I'll show that before our workshop ends. It's from TechSmith, the same company that, pub that, that offers Camtasia. Yeah. I just want to get back to your point. Yeah. In the old days, flip classrooms used to call, be called Do the Reading. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And, and I can't tell you how frustrating it is to start you know, having to have students ask questions where the example is spelled out in the book, and you say, well, what was confusing about this? And they're like, oh, nothing's confusing about that. I just never looked at it. <laughs> and I taught a class actually in that room last term, and at the end of the class, I asked, was there a benefit in me just summarizing the information and presenting it to you from the chapter almost in the same order? And many of the students nodded, uh, and, and one raised his hand, who was kind of a wise guy anyway, mm -hmm. and said, to accurately answer your question, I would have to have done the reading. And I said, who else does that apply to? And he said, your lectures are so good. Yeah. You know, it covers all the material. And I said, did you ever read? We stopped reading after the first two weeks mm -hmm. when we knew we would cover it here. And then it dawned on me that this is an incredibly inefficient way to present information to students. Um, and it's frustrating. I don't know what to do. I, I'm not going to make videos because me doing it by video just saves the time of doing it every term. Mm -hmm. But I, I did talk to, uh, to Steve Yalsov at Michigan. And what he does is he uses perusal. And basically, this is an online uh, tool where you go through the book and you make comments. If you don't understand something or if you do understand something, and students can comment back and forth on each other's uh, comments before the text. And it gives you a summary of the areas that are challenging for students in the in the text. They peer educate online while it's happening. I have never used this. And I'm going to use it this term, and I'm probably going to regret offering it now. <laughs> How do you spell it? Like that? Perusal? Two L's. Two L's.
is going to have students do more reading and be prepared and come in with their questions. And the reason I like this better than the quiz method is because I don't think it's fair to grade students on something that I haven't had a chance to explain to them. If they honestly have read the chapter, don't understand it, they should have the opportunity to say, I don't understand this because this is confusing for these reasons or this is not, does not make sense to me for these reasons. And for me, that's great. That's the information I want coming into class. Rather than, oh, you know, I had to guess there were 12 answers, I guessed, I got a zero or I got it right, who knows? And so I'm, I'm hopeful that this is gonna be more in the right direction. Was this created by Eric Mazur? Yeah. Eric Mazur, yeah, the physics professor at Harvard I referenced earlier. just to read. Mm -hmm. So you put in the comments, and if you put in 10 comments from when you read the top five, and then that's it. So it should really encourage I hope, reading. The, the advice I got was please make sure that you don't give them the standard, hey, read chapters one through three, because it'll be too much, and they won't actually get through it, they won't be able to process it, they'll have so many questions, it's unclear, so you have to break it into very small manifestations. <coughs> So, yeah, so this is the trick. It's got to, they have to buy the e text through perusal. Uh -huh. But I, the only thing I can tell you is that perusal e texts are cheaper than our bookstore, they're cheaper than Amazon, at least for the ones that I'm doing for this store. And like they've got to be able to negotiate it with their, what's that? Like how much are they? Uh, I think this term it was, I can tell you exactly if I bought to look it up, but I think it was like $70 something dollars. I think in our bookstore it was 200 right? Can the students access it indefinitely? So it depends. If they rent, they can do a 120-day rental for half the price of buying the book, where they can access it indefinitely for, for that. And the great part about it is that, I mean, to me, that they that if I ask a question, Albert can say, oh, here, you know, check this out. This is the part that, that was confusing to me, but now I figured it out. Here's the answer. Or he can say, I have the same question. Uh, and to me, that's exciting because it gets back to, you're the reading, go do it. And if there's problems, let me know. So that way, Yes. Uh, it's interesting. Every every faculty member seems to be giving a software. I want to know if anybody knows a software that's really good at tracking attendance. Does anybody use anything? At tracking what? Attendance. Attendance. I guess another thing you could do this I just thought is, is to take one class to 
to to uh, emulate the behavior you're trying to elicit from the students. So here's what I'd like you guys to do each day or each for each class, and then walk them walk them through it. But uh, I, I, the 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 big thing is to teach them to become autonomous learners, to share share knowledge and information, to highlight and motivate them. Uh, and and you don't have to, you, you, when you first start, there's no need to do it for an entire class. You can pick one, co one topic and say, I think I'm going to change the way I teach just for this one topic that might cover a day or a week. And try that and see, get your feet wet. Uh, and you can tell the students, for this one chapter, I'm going to teach this one chapter differently. And here's why I'm going to do it. And here's how it's going to work. And then afterwards, we'll see how everyone liked it. So basically, I've, I've reached the end of the talk. We want to we teach students to become autonomous learners. We want to inspire them instead of filling a bucket. Instead of thinking of students as sponges that absorb every word of ours, <laughs> we want to inspire them and, and motivate them. And uh, for our discussion, I would like to make sure we cover everything that was in the abstract. We may have done it already. But the first question in the abstract was, how much work is flipping and how much time does it take? Have we answered that question? It varies. Your answer may vary. <laughs> You, you could spend very little time, or you could spend hours and hours and hours. Uh, it, it may vary depending on what technique you use, what material you r refer students to, or do you create your own. It'll definitely vary. The next question was, do you have to make videos? I, th I think we've answered that. Some of you do, and others refer students to pre-existing content, and you can do a mixture of both. You definitely want, I, I definitely urge you to do something, even if it's just a five minute video that introduces the students to the class. Or like I do, it's a select number of videos that, that clarify topics that students consistently struggle with every semester. And sometimes I don't even, even give them those videos in advance. I wait for the question to be asked in class or to pop up on the discussion board in an online course I teach. And I go, oh yeah, I can use that video I created, you know, a year ago and refer them to it. So you, you definitely, you can, it varies. You can create a small number of videos or a large number of videos or anything in between. Can you still give lectures? Absolutely. It has its time and place. I recommend no more than 10 minutes, and I recommend that you intersperse mini lectures with group work and collaboration and techniques like think, pair, share. It's time consuming, but again, you don't have to deliver all this content that you did in a traditional course. Uh, the next question, do you have to invert an entire class or can you just flip one lesson at a time? I think we've answered that. You may want to try taking one lesson. And if it's successful, and if you and your students like it, do more lessons, and then eventually flip an entire class if that's your goal. How do you prepare students to learn on their own or learn in groups? That's probably the most difficult question in this list, isn't it? There are students who insist on working independently, who don't want to work with anyone else. A math professor who did group work in a room next to me had a student who said, I will not, I'm not going to do any group work, and actually complained to the dean that I'm being made to work in groups and I don't want to. <laughs> That's tough. Uh, poor guy. Yeah, I wouldn't be so insistent on it. I kind of that's what we came to the conclusion here today, right? Don't, it's not such a big deal. If someone wants to work independently, let them. That's fine. Uh, here's something else I do. During the time where they're working on homework or taking quizzes, the second part of the class, I walk around. And if a student asks me a question, I'll, I'll help them. And then say I walk around, and a few minutes later, another student asks me the same question, which is very common, isn't it? Typically, there's a concept, a topic, that students struggle with. And I say to that student, you know what? 
Sue and I just, let me introduce you to an expert. Sue and I just talked about that. Sue, you know that question you and I worked on five minutes? Could you explain it? <laughs> Could you tell me? <laughs> Could you tell Albert how he got it? And so I'm, I'm off the hook, and I can continue walking around and visiting with students while she tells you how to do that problem. Yes? Is that better to do or to stop for a moment and go back to the board and explain it? Because if two students in the class are asking how many students. Yeah, if it's just two, I wouldn't do that. But you're right. If a third one comes up, you're right. I would stop the class and say, oh, wait a minute. A lot of you are struggling with this concept. Let's take a look at it. You know, turn your monitors off. Eyes up front, <laughs> and let's have a look at this. You're obviously, yeah, you're right. You need to be sensitive to that. Maybe you've taught something, you did a poor job teaching one particular topic or concept, or the book does a poor job of explaining it. And yeah, absolutely, I often do that. Stop what everyone's doing. Time for a mini lesson on this. Yeah, I, I think the reason that the results are dubious are be, well, we talked about this this morning. I, when I talk about the advantages and, and the benefits of inverting or flipping a class, I'm comparing that to a traditional lecture class, and they did not. They compared it to an active learning class. And to me, flipping is just another form of active learning, so you really don't have to flip. If you do, do some of these things like we discussed, think, pair, share, where I'll, I'll often um, have students think, I, I use that every day, students think quietly about a problem, then they pair up, and, and then I, I tell students, I'm warning you, I, I'll play, I play music in the classroom, I'm going to play this song, it lasts four minutes, when it's over, I'm going to call on a student volunteer to share how they got their answer. And I, f I used to write every student's name on a three by five card and shuffle the deck and pick one. You can have students write their names on popsicle sticks and put it in a cup and pick one out at random. Or I've got a graphing calculator that can pick a random integer from one to 30. And, and I warned them, I'm gonna call on someone to volunteer to share how they got their answer. So make sure if you're struggling, you might be called on Make sure you get help from someone, in, from me or someone in the class. So that kind of gives them an incentive to make sure they spend those four minutes if effectively, because they may be called on. And if they don't get it, it's no big deal. I just call in another student at random. And if they don't get it, I call in a third student at random. And if they don't get it, your situation comes up. Ah, I've obviously not taught this concept very well. Let's take a look as a group at this problem. And then we go over it in class. And I often have students come up to the podium and, and share their work and explain their work, explain their thinking. Uh, okay. So that answers the question about learning on their own or, or in groups. I guess my, if, that's why I don't care if students are checking Facebook or email in class because of, if, they can, if they end up being the one getting called on at random to explain their thinking and share their answer, I'm fine. I don't care if they spend a few minutes on Facebook. So that's how I get over it. I don't, everybody's welcome to bring cell phones and laptops. Some of us learn faster than others. And the ones who learn fast, I don't want to penalize them with not being able to multitask in class. But as long as they, if they get called on at random, as long as they can come up and explain their thinking and share their answer, I'm happy. What structures can you use to make the flipped classroom work for you and your students? Well, one thing you have to do is sell them on this method of instruction, don't you? There will be students who resist, who are used to the lecture system and are very good at it and don't want to change. So one structure is you got to sell it, baby. <laughs> you got to tell you got to tell them what you're doing and tell them why you're doing it or or or, or they won't cooperate or they'll they'll resist it. And then the other thing you have to do is 
you know, the, the, the details. How does it work? What exactly are you going to do minute by minute during class and outside of class? So that is our goal. And that covers all the questions that were posed in the abstract. So what do you think? Have we covered everything? Yeah. So you teach math, so you've got homework and you do the problem? Yeah. So do they do all the homework in your classroom? Both. Yeah. Uh, the second half of the class is homework. And it's it's computerized. And it, when they open up the question, the numbers are different for everyone. So I'm happy. That's another problem with a traditional static book. When you go over a question in class, you know, most many of the students have already answered it, and it's sleep time for them. But if you change the numbers, it's a different but similar question. It's new for everyone, and you can get participation. It's the Pearson My Lab called my math lab what course oh I teach everything from basic math community college students that are still struggling with adding subtract multiply divide fractions decimals and percent on up to calculus and beyond and everything in between and they have calculus yeah differential equations linear algebra is all available on my math lab it's awesome. The only problem with computer-based instruction is its emphasis on skill and drill. It's, it, it's very little high concept, although there are publishers working to overcome that. I've been using my math lab for 13 years, and it's been the best program out there. But lately, publishers such as McGraw-Hill are coming up with Connect Master. And they're asking very high-level concept questions. And there's a lot of reading and a lot of English in it. And I asked our ESL department chair, and I showed her some sample questions. And I said, you know, Nancy, there's a lot of students in my class for whom English is not their native language. I, I, do I dare introduce this new program? And she said, absolutely. Our community college students need to learn how to speak and understand English. So go for it, Fred. So she gave me permission to do it. Uh, another program, another publishing company is Cengage, who does WebEx. Uh, web, uh, is that what it's called? Yeah. Uh, they've come up with a new program called MindTap. And I'm going to be piloting that this, this semester. It uses a lot of game theory. Yeah. There's a concept that, that comes up, and, and they can play a game if they choose to do so. And if they do well on it, it assigns them fewer homework questions. How cool is that? <laughs> so there's a lot of ways of overcoming that. But still, I rely on what we do online or in class to add that conceptual, higher understanding level that's missing as a component in most computer-based learning programs. You've got to get students to explain their thinking and justify their answers. I mean, as, as, as an, ex an example, if you tell someone the answer, you know, say 2 to the x equals 10, could you solve that exponential equation? And the answer is, oh, dude, you just take the log of this number and divide it by the log of that number. And if someone comes up to the board and does that, I'll I say, great, why'd you do that? Uh, I don't know. This is the chapter on exponential equations, and that's what you do. Well, why? How'd you get that? I tell students about the grandmother study. Have you ever heard of that? They, they took three groups and uh, gave them math concepts to learn and a test to take. The first control group, they provided no support or assistance whatsoever. The second group, they gave them all the tutoring they wanted, you know, professional, competent, master tutors that they could go to for help. And the third group, they had them meet with a grandmother type, an old person, who when they were asked a question would just say, gee, I don't know, that's a good question. What does it say in the book? <laughs> or, oh, that's a really hard question, isn't it? What did your professor say, you know, to do about that kind of thing? Is, oh, I don't know the answer to that. What do you think? <laughs> right? 
And guess who scored higher on the tests after that? The grandmother group. <laughs> So I often tell students about that study, that you don't have to have an expert like me or a professional tutor. Just pretend your grandmother, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your cousin, whatever, is looking over your shoulder, and for every step of every question you do, pretend they're asking you, well, why'd you do that? How, how come? And if you can answer it, you'll have a great understanding of the material, and you'll probably get, a, as a reward, a very high grade in the class. Ha, ha, ha.